Hello, everyone, and welcome to my talk. The title is Picking Inside the Engine of Zio SQL. Uh, my name is Jaroslav Regec, and I work at Scala C. I'm a Zio SQL contributor, and I'm a fan of functional programming. So today on the agenda, we have a couple of things. So we, have a lo we will talk about lower level library, Zio Schema, and we will talk about also some language features like implicit, macros, and phantom types. Now, here I want to emphasize that you don't need to know any of these things in order to use Zio SQL. Zio SQL is a higher level library that's very simple to use, and this talk just demonstrates how powerful Scala language is. So we can build these higher level libraries on top of this lower level, maybe a little bit more complex, but powerful features. So the motivation for this talk came to me as an idea a few months ago when I was writing a blog post about Zio SQL. And in, in that blog post, I was working with three tables, so city, metro system, and metro, metro lines. And uh, these tables had a one-to-many relationship between them. So I wanted to write a SQL like this. So it's, uh, it's a simple query uh, that has an aggregate count function. Basically, it aggregates number of metro lines, and it shows the city name and metro system name. And uh, it's, a, it's a join across three tables. So Zio SQL query looks like this. So as you can see, it looks almost as the, as the SQL. It's also very type safe. If you, if you forget to group by metro line name or city name, it will, it, it will not compile. So I was pretty happy about this. Uh, I think it looks great. But then, well, in order to write this, you need to first describe your tables. Because this metro line name or city name, the, these values, they need to come from somewhere. So you need to do this. And to be honest, I don't really like this. Because, well, just take a look at this at at nullable thing or plus plus operator. So it's just another DSL to learn. And uh, it's a bit bottle platey. So I thought that maybe we could, we could improve in this part. So what I would like to do instead is to do what Doobie does, right? So with Doobie, you just, you just write your query. And if you're, if you're familiar with SQL, then, well, you write it right away, and that's it. Now, this approach has its problem, problems on its own. So obviously, it's just a string. So you can, you can write a typo. ID won't help you. So uh, maybe, I don't know, it, it looks like there is this balance between, between type safety and no boilerplate. And we, we cannot have both. Now, let's think about what would be the more ideal way to d describe our table. So why don't we just use a simple case class? We, as a Scala developer, we are used to writing case classes. I think we write them all the time. We have ID shortcuts to write them. And we, we can use the option type to describe nullable columns. So let me introduce the define table method that would take one type parameter, city, well, the, the uh, type of our case class, and it would return to us the description of our table. So now let's pretend that we are library authors and let's write this defined table method together. So before we can, we can write the implementation of defined table, we need to actually know what we are talking about. So let's take a look what, what is the table. So the table is a seal trait, and we need to, uh, uh, we need to implement a couple of, couple of types and a couple of values. So we need some table type. It can even be abstract type member. All column identities, uh, that would be intersection type of uh, column named singletons. And what we really need is the type and value of columns, which is the tuple of like descriptions of our columns. So if we have city which has five columns, then this, it would be a tuple five. And then we need the name of the table. 
So uh, let me introduce the column. Column is parameterized over the type, and it, uh, we need a type tag uh, because we don't, well, not every types are supported in SQL, and we need the column name. But for our DSL, we need something uh, more, more abstract. A col column, at the very least, doesn't have a notion of, of its table. So uh, let me introduce the expert. It's our own ZeoSQL expert. And I thought that the best way to, to tell you what, what is the expert is to show you a couple of examples. So expert is, are those uh, values that we use in our DSLs. So expert can represent the source column, expert can re represent a literal selection. It, it also can represent uh, like a var clause, and it also can represent the function call. Now, this is how the implementation of table for, for, the, for the city table would look like. So the table type would be just the city. All column identities, as I said, would be this intersection type of uh, column, column name singleton. And type columns is the tuple five of these experts. And value columns is the same, just, just at the value level. And the name would be pluralized city, so cities. Let's get back to uh, our defined table city. But, well, the users uh, will have their own tables. Everyone's working with different databases. So we need to change city for a T. Well, suddenly, we know absolutely nothing about the T. We don't know how many columns there are in the database. We don't know what is the table name. So at this point, it's clear that we need to use some tricks. And the first trick that I'll introduce is the Zia schema. Zia schema is an amazing library that captures the structure of data as a value. So if we have a schema of a T, suddenly we know much more about the T, and maybe we can even implement the fine table. So uh, I think the best way to show like, what, what schema is is to show the example of a case class 2. So case class 2 describes like, some case class with two fields, like a person with a name and an age. So here we, we can see we have access to the uh, to the field names, to the field types, uh, how to construct, deconstruct uh, the case class. But probably the, the most interesting methods for us are these uh, type level function accessors and a method make accessors. So if you're familiar with optics, then you know that lens is a recipe of how to access a term in a record. Now this type level function accessors returns us the tuple of these two recipes of how to access field one and field two in the case class that have two fields. In order to implement make accessors, we need so-called accessor builder, which we will implement inside ZeoSQL. So since we only care about uh, des describing our table with case classes, we will only uh, here implement lens and make lens. And if you think about it more, as lens is a recipe how to access a term in a record, and expert is a recipe of how to access a column in a table, it actually turns out that our expert is, uh, is, is the lens. So we will implement this in a, in a second. OK, let, let's get back. Now uh, we require our defined table method to accept uh, the value of schema. We will make it an implicit, so compiler like in injects the schema for us, and we will require directly schema of the record because uh, we don't want to describe table with, uh, I don't know, seal traits. Right, so first of all, table type could be just a T, that's easy. Uh, name of the table, well, we have a ID on the schema, and ID has a name, so that could work. We just then need to pluralize it. For all column identities, we can delegate to schema that field names. And for the columns, type and value, it's time to create our own accessor builder. 
And uh, as, you ca as I talked about like a minute ago, the lens would be just this extra. And uh, make lens is uh, easy to implement because we have a, a schema of the whole record and we have the schema of the field. So we have everything we need. We just uh, derive type tag because not every type is supported in SQL. And we can, we can create the value of uh, the expert source, which represents the, the column in the, in the table. Now at the bottom, we have our value, expert accessor builder. And we use it to uh, implement uh, the type columns and, and value columns. So you, you can see for, for the type columns, we are using this uh, type level function in, in the schema that I, that I described before. So let's test it. Uh, so here we have a payment case class with the amount payment method, which could be card or cash. We have some another note case class. Well, so payment method is a subtype, and sub, sometimes I'm sorry, some types are not supported in, in SQL. And note is a is another case class which is nested. So this would this would fail to derive type tag, or probably this would fail at some other point. But compiler doesn't tell us that anything's wrong here. So we need some more tricks. And let me first introduce implicits, and then we will see how they may, may help us here. So uh, implicits are overloaded keyword. Uh, well, we have implicit vals, uh, we have implicit devs, implicit classes. So like with implicit class, uh, we, can, we can create the extension method, like this, is, uh, this would log how, how long did, did it take for zero effect to run. In implicit dev, we can see that we can call full method with an int, even though uh, it, it takes the string, because int, int is implicitly converted to string. Uh, but for me and for us, the, more, uh, the most in, uh, interesting are implicit vals. So the way I like to think about implicit vals is that they provide a so-called term inference. And it's like an opposite of type inference. You, everyone probably heard about the type inference. So you, if you have a val x equals 10, uh, compiler knows that x is an integer. Uh, y is equal to foo. Compiler knows that type of y is a string. Now, term inference uh, is, is like the opposite. So we want compiler to, to create uh, type value of type int. So we, we know the type, but uh, we don't know the value. Uh, so obviously, we, we must tell compiler what value to, uh, to create, uh, so in some scope. Now, uh, sealed classes or traits uh, allow us to control uh, who can create instances of sealed classes and traits. So unless we have uh, constructors in companion objects, only in the same file can we create an instance of a sealed class and a trait. So uh, let's imagine that this defined table method would require some uh, implicit sealed trait, and we will control the instances that compiler can create of this sealed trait. And we will only create it in case some uh, conditions are satisfied. So uh, to be specific, Let's, uh, let's create a table-like um, seal trait that would be parameterized over t. And uh, we, we ask compiler to create the table-like, because it's implicit in the define table method. And in the companion object of table-like, uh, right away we create the instance, this compatible table. Now, th this, would, this would do nothing, but uh, Actually, at the point where, where you can see the, the, uh, the comment, we need to do something to inspect the T and only create the instance uh, if T satisfies some criteria that we like or fails some preferably compiled uh, error message. Now, we could introduce more implicits uh, because we have a schema of T, but the error message wouldn't be really nice. So uh, there's one last trick that we could use. So let's talk about macros. 
So the way I understand macros, even though I'm not an expert, is that uh, they, they turn the code into a data, into a tree-like representation. And this, this conversion happens at compile time, and it can fail. And at the call side, when this conversion fails, it's visible like a, like a compile time error message. So uh, this is really useful for, for DSLs like, like ZSQL. And let's see it in action. So here is the implementation of is compatible uh, method. And I mark the important parts in bold. So SQL primitive se sequence contains the, the uh, list of types that we support. So like boolean, string, int, option, whatever. And uh, incompatible uh, is uh, peeking inside the, the structure of the T and is uh, storing all the types that uh, are not like SQL primitives. And the important is this uh, if-else block. So if the, if the T is actually not a case class, then we fail with a compile time error message that you can only define table with case class. If its compatible sequence is not empty, then we write an error message. Uh, well, these are unsupported types by SQL. And otherwise, we just create the compatible table instance. Now, uh, macro in action uh, actually uh, fails when we try to, well, fails with uh, compiler fails to, to compile with these unsupported types by SQL error message when we try to define table with, uh, with the payment. And here, we could write uh, any, any error message that, that we want. So it's very powerful. Now, uh, we have our define table method already implemented. But as we have some more time, I would like to uh, show you more tricks that we use in ZSQL just, just for fun. So for, first of all, we, we use uh, heavily phantom types. And this example is not from uh, ZSQL. It's just like introduction to phantom types. So a phantom type is a type for which uh, there exists no value. Its only purpose is to provide more type safety. So here in this example, we don't want users to create an endpoint. We have an endpoint builder uh, that we want users of our library to use. And in companion object, you, um, when they call apply, the phantom type P will be any. Now, we only allow to call build in case P is a subtype of URL with port. And any doesn't add anything to intersection type. And URL with port are supported when uh, with, with URL and with port methods are, are called on a builder. OK, back to ZSQL. So I showed you before the expert, and there was this uh, phantom type parameter f. And uh, we have uh, this more complex structure of phantom types. So uh, phantom type can be type source aggregated, which contains another of our phantom types, union, which contains two of the other phantom types, literal function zero derived. Now, uh, again, the same expert examples, but this time I also am showing uh, what, how the phantom type look like. So for the uh, expert source, which describe the uh, column in a table, the phantom type is the source uh, with the name of the uh, table and name of the column. For the expert literal, phantom type is literal. And for the uh, expert relational, phantom type is union of, in this case, source and literal. But it could be anything else, depending on uh, what, you, what, you, what kind of uh, relational expert you're, you're creating here. So how is this useful? Uh, let's say we have a seal trait is source, and this f is our uh, phantom type. And we will create the instance of is source only in case f is source. So like we have some DS, DS part of DSLs like this update. And uh, in update, we want to set some value to some, to some column. Uh, so it doesn't make sense to use expr, which, are, which is not description of, of a column. So uh, like here, the 
we required the f to have the implicit uh, instance of is source. So another example, a little bit more complicated, is this uh, is partially aggregated sealed trait, uh, which has a type member unaggregated. And uh, unaggregated, unaggregated is the union of all phantom types, but aggregated. So uh, example is this select DSL. And select DSL has a selection which is uh, like ageless like structure of the expert. And we require also the instance of is partially aggregated. Now, at the beginning, uh, when, I show you the, when I showed you the uh, DSL where I selected Metro and City9, and uh, I, had, I have here aggregation function, then I told you that if you, not, if you don't group by, by, by metro, metro line and city name, the example uh, won't compile. And it's actually powered by, by phantom types, because here, after this select, the phantom type F has the, uh, has the structure, as you can see. It's the union of source, source aggregated, and this path dependent type unaggregated on the I, so is partial aggregated instance, uh, has the type of union source and source. So we know exactly by which experts we need to call group by on. And uh, there are many more tricks uh, in ZOSQL that we use. So expert is a nice uh, example of GADT and declarative functional design. So um, type level programming is all over the place. And we also use ZOSchema dynamic value. It's useful when we translate uh, some like value t of type t into SQL. Well, we have the schema of a t. So if we uh, transform it to dynamic value, then we can nicely pattern match on dynamic value and, and write the SQL. So let's sum up. So back to our original example. Um, now. I think that this is less uh, boilerplate and uh, it's more natural. Uh, we, can def define we can describe table with just a type parameter city, uh, which is a case class. So this will be available in ZOSQL release 010. Apologies, we didn't make the release uh, till this talk, but uh, it's going to be out in a couple of hours. Um, so and there are two overloads of the fine table method. So the fine table smart is doing smart pluralization according to English grammar, as you would expect. Also, irregular verbs are pluralized. Uh, or, or you can um, explicitly provide the name of the table. Now, for the future of ZOSQL, before we can think about production-ready release, uh, we need to polish the library, uh, fix some bugs, do a better job with documentation. Uh, there are a couple of little features that we're missing, but most of all, many people are asking for Scala-free support, and uh, I will focus on that uh, in the upcoming weeks, because I guess it's natural that people want to use new technologies together. Uh, so yeah, that, that's all from me. Uh, I would like to thank uh, organizers of this conference, uh, just this year, we had uh, two conferences, two hackathons organized by, by Zyverge and Scala C, and that, that's, that's great. It's an exciting time to be a Scala developer, and thank you all for listening.